Hi, this is Josh Spicer from GameWisdom.com. Hope you enjoyed this critical thought, a detailed discussion on game design, and be sure to subscribe and you can pitch future critical thought topics. Alright everybody, I got a quick critical thought for you today, but this is going to be a very interesting one. We're going to be talking about controller designer UIs when it comes to game pads and keyboard based games. The other night I was talking to Josh, who we did a Patreon fun and critical thought about two months ago. Basically two Josh's thought about game design, who would have thunk that? But we got on the subject of control schemes, and specifically from Nintendo. And Josh and Josh were basically talking about uh, how Nintendo has gotten really good at making very well-defined and easy-to-follow controls for their games, like Zelda, Mario, and the like. And this brings back an interesting topic. I know we've spoken about controller design several times here on the Critical Thoughts, but it really is an understated topic. And the reason is very simple. When a developer has a really good control scheme for a game, be it, again, a gamepad or a keyboard and mouse game, you rarely will register that. The only times you really notice when the controls are doing something is when it's a bad thing. Be it um, putting too many commands on a single button, controls just feeling weird, unresponsive, floaty, anything like that. So for today's critical thought, this is going to be kind of summarizing some of the various topics we've talked about when it comes to good uh, controller layout or button layouts for your games. And we got here to help me, if I can hold this up right, we got two controllers, if I can get them both on the screen, there we go. See, we're, we're uh, advancing here. So the first thing that you want to do as a game designer when you're trying to figure out your control scheme for your game is understanding the neutral position. The neutral position essentially is what, how the person's going to hold a gamepad or have their hands on the keyboard and mouse when they're not doing anything. This is the most comfortable way of basically interacting. For instance, when I'm holding a gamepad, if I, it's going to be hard to see, but if you notice this, I'm holding it so that my thumbs are on the analog sticks, my index fingers are on L2 and R2, and of course, both of my palms are on each, I guess, what do we call these? Nubs? Um, extensions of the controller or something like that. But the point is, however my hands are in the neutral position, this is how you should start to base your game's um, control scheme on. For instance, when I'm holding a 360 controller, it's a little bit different. When I'm holding this control like this, my left thumb's going to be on the left analog stick, indexes are on the triggers, but my right thumb normally is going to be on X and A. And that is due to how the gamepad's laid out. When I'm on the 360, we can do it like this. Let me see if I can hold it. Again, it's not easy to do this backwards. But one of the beauties, and we'll talk about how we switch between analog sticks and buttons in a few minutes. But, when it comes to the neutral position, this is where you have to start figuring out your primary actions for your game. The primary actions are the main verbs that go into playing your title, something the player is going to be doing constantly. If we're talking a first person shooter, moving, aiming, shooting. Platformer, moving, jumping, controlling the camera. Even something like a stealth game will involve moving, some kind of context-sensitive hide button, and maybe an interact button. The point is, once you've established what your primary actions are, those actions will normally be put onto the buttons for your neutral position. So when I'm playing a first-person shooter, if you notice, most first-person shooters will keep the shoot on one of the two triggers. And there's actually two reasons for that. But the first one that I want to talk about is that, once again, when you're holding the controller like this, again, it's kind of hard to hold it, it, your fingers are going to be resting on the triggers here. So you don't need to basically think about it to shoot your weapon off in a first-person shooter. Your fingers are already going to be there. There's no need to adjust your hands and anything like that. Now, 
Another part of designing a control scheme, besides understanding the primary and the secondary, are that there are several little tips and tricks you can do when it comes to creating your control scheme to make it easier for people to play. And this is where we get to some of the more fascinating parts of control design. Again, I know we've talked about these on separate occasions, but I think this is the first time we're kind of lumping it all into a single video. So the first thing, and this is what I was talking to Josh about the other night, is a, basically double association, meaning taking the button or the command press here on the controller and doing something or figuring out a way to associate that to an action on screen. Now, what I just said a second ago regarding first-person shooters and the fact that the triggers are normally for your shooting. Another reason for that is very simple. As we all know, shooting a gun involves, well, pulling a trigger. So, it makes sense to make your triggers a shoot button on a first-person shooter. Because, again, you will immediately associate that and the player will never have to worry about being confused or in the heat of the moment forgetting what button is the fire button. Now, there's also other ways you can do this. One of the older examples would be from the first fighting games on the consoles. Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, Killer Instinct, those kinds of games. What they did was, if we look at the controller here, because it is very similar. There we go. What they normally do is that X and A... Wow, it's not easy looking at this and doing this in reverse, but X and A would represent the low punch and low kick, while Y and B would represent the high or the strong versions. And then you would have L and R over here being like the heavy buttons, if I'm remembering right from Mortal Kombat, or maybe it was Street Fighter. But the point is, what they were doing was associating the position of the buttons to the relative strength of the attacks. So if I'm pressing the lower buttons on the controller, I know these are going to be quick attacks. If I'm pressing the buttons that are highest on the controller, these are going to be the heavy ones. And again, I want to mention this here, but what I just described, it sounds very simple. And keep that in the back of your mind, because I want to go into a little bit more detail after this next example. But one of the really great examples of this kind of double association is from the Assassin's Creed series. So if you remember Assassin's Creed, what they used was what was called, oh, I can't really do a you know, double quote here, but they used a paper doll interface for how the controls worked. What happened was each button basically corresponded to a different part of your character's body. So X was the legs, square and circle were your arms, triangle was your head. And what happened was all the commands were categorized into these four different areas. So for the X, since it was dealing with your legs, this represented jumping, uh, dropping down, stuff along, or even just running, because when you're holding down X while you're walking, you run, because X is for your legs. Square could have been for your melee attack, circle could have been for blocking or countering, and then triangle was like first person aiming and just looking in first person. And again, once again, you have this double association. Legs are on the bottom, so X is on the bottom. Square and circle here, and so on. Now, as I was just saying, what I just described, and the other examples we'll talk about here, these are all very simple things. And I'm sure while I'm describing these things, a few of you are probably going, what's the big deal, Josh? Wow, you know, triangle, higher button, does more damage. That, that really took a lot. But that's the thing. When it comes to good controller or control scheme layouts and design, it's these very little and simple things that can do a lot to make your game easier to play. And again, like we said at the start, when this works, most people will not notice this. Unless you are actively, you know, examining or dissecting a game, you probably won't notice the controls unless there's a problem, which makes it very interesting and sometimes very difficult to talk about. And for those of you watching this, can you think of other examples of games that had really good control schemes, be it from a standard genre like real-time strategy, first-person shooter, or something very esoteric, something from a game that may just be a one-off, 
something crazy like Nights in the Nightmare or The World Ends With You. But let me know in the comments. Now, when it comes to design controls, we've talked, we spent the last about nine minutes discussing some of the things you can do to make things better. But it's important to talk about some of the things to avoid. One of them is what we, what I was talking to Josh about, is kind of like finger twisting. When you have multiple primary and important commands all spread throughout the controls to the point that it becomes very hard to comfortably hold the controls and make these commands. For instance, let's say we're playing a first person shooter and I'm busy using my triggers, but while I'm trying to aim and shoot, the only way to activate a special power would be to use my D-pad. So basically I have to have a thumb on the analog stick, index finger on the trigger, another thumb on the second analog stick to move, and I still need to figure out how to press the D-pad all at the same time. This is where, again, the neutral position will help you out when designing your control scheme. Because once you know how comfortable it is to hold this gamepad, or whatever you have, you want to build your control scheme around that. Now another major point is what, is called, or what I like to call control shifting. That is when you have to completely change how you hold a gamepad or using a keyboard when you're trying to perform different actions. Basically what ends up happening is that the neutral position is not good enough and you have to adjust things. Now when it comes to the PS4 or the DualShock controller, this is actually set up very easily for this kind of transition. I can either hold it down here and have my thumbs resting on the analog sticks, or I hold it up with my fingers on the D-pad and buttons. But one thing you want to avoid though is having to do that multiple times. I'm sorry, having to do that consistently during a play. You don't want the player to be constantly adjusting their hands while they're trying to play a game. One of the things that we've seen also when it comes to the keyboard is basically just crazily just putting commands willy-nilly, I guess, on the keys. For example, I could be... I don't want to lift my keyboard, I'm afraid I may drop it, but it would be kind of like having movement being WSAD like we're all used to, and then having important commands be at Z, X, C, and V. Now again, if you're just thinking about that while you're putting keys together, it doesn't sound that bad. But here's the question. How am I supposed to comfortably hit Z, X, C, or V, or any one of those keys, while I'm trying to keep my hands on W, S, A, D, and you know, the classic you know, claw position at the same time? And that's one, another little trick you want to avoid, is if you're going to have important commands, those that have to be entered either at the same time or very close to each other, don't have them associated to the same hand. And when I say the same hand, I mean the stuff that my left hand can reach or the commands that my right hand can reach. If I'm busy trying to block using my right thumb on the circle, then don't get, put the counter command as, let's say, a square on the controller as well, because how am I supposed to do both reliably? In that case, you would probably make the block command be L1 or R2, because my left hand is independent of that. I can do these commands at the same time, and it's a lot easier and less strain. But again, one of the hallmarks of good UI and control scheme design comes down to play testing. Again, the quicker you can get something sketched out, mapped to a gamepad or a keyboard, and then start putting it in front of people to see how they respond, the easier it's going to be to design your control scheme. And one thing is certainly for sure, no matter how well you think about it in your head, chances are you may have to make adjustments once you start putting it to game and to code. Now, a few last quick points before we wrap up today's critical thought. And that is, the first one has to do with the subject of remapping uh, buttons or keys. This is a usually a requested feature for most games and a lot of gamers consider it to be standard when it comes to either PC or computer games. And I generally like to agree with that. It's something that a lot of players won't generally need to use, but it can make life a lot easier. 
For instance, when I was playing Near Automata, I adjusted the control schemes to make it easier for me to play it, and I kind of just tweaked things along that way. Was it better or worse than what was there? Well, that's debatable, but for me, that's what I wanted to do. And again, this is one of those things that if you don't have in your game, it will annoy people. But with that said, there is a very important point here. Whether or not you have a remapping feature, you still have to do work on making your control scheme. You can't just take your first idea, throw it on a gamepad, and then just say, let the fans remap it, I don't care anymore. No, never do that. Remapping keys or remapping buttons should be the last thing on the player's mind. Because the easier you can make your game for someone to get into, the more it's going to help you out in the long run. One of the things that is kind of painful to go back to with older games is how crazy they design their control schemes, especially on the PC. Because back then, people thought, well, we have all these keys, so we might as well use them. So you have commands all over the place. And with a lot of those older games, I remember having to spend like 5-10 minutes just tearing down their entire control scheme and rebuilding it back up. Now again, that would solve the problem, but there shouldn't be a problem like this in the first place. Especially if you take your time and you do the play testing and what you need to do. Now, one other point, and again, like I said, we're about 16 minutes in, and I could spend probably another 20, 30 minutes on control scheme and control UI design. But I want to briefly touch on one of the biggest uh, benefits or advantages that came over the last decade, and that was context-sensitive actions or context-sensitive buttons. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, what we're referring to is when multiple commands are assigned to a single button and the game will perform the respective command when the context is needed. So, for instance, um, let's say Square is, there we go, let's say Square is not only your interact button, but it's also the button that lets you, um, I don't know, how about reload? That's also your, your reload button. And this way, what context sensitive buttons or actions allow you to do is map more commands than you actually have buttons for. And this is very big in terms of streamlining and making games easier to play. The Zelda series, and once again going back to Nintendo, are really good examples of context-sensitive uh, context commands in action. What they did was they removed the jump function from a lot of the 3D Zeldas and simply said, you run a ledge, Link jumps automatically, because we don't need that, you don't need to do that command otherwise. And that's how you can decide what commands should be context sensitive and which ones need their own button. If you have a primary action, something that the player is going to be doing constantly, if not multiple times within the span of a minute, that needs its own button, and generally those buttons are going to remain just for that one feature. Again, if I'm playing a first-person shooter and I'm trying to, you know, shoot enemies with whatever guns I have, I don't want my shoot action to accidentally, I don't know, vault over a, <laughs> a chest-high wall by accident. This is what ends up happening in a lot of lesser games when too many commands are put onto a single button. Another thing to watch out for are too many similar commands on the same button. For instance, if I'm going to have my a dodge button or a dodge command, and I also have the command that opens up a door in a horror game, for instance, those two should not be on the same button. Because what could end up happening is I'm running towards the door, I hit the button, but let's say there's an enemy behind me, and instead of opening up the door to escape, my guy does his like little juke and jukes away from the door, and now I'm trapped in the room with a monster. But uh, let's wrap it up here before I just start talking, for, uh, or I keep talking for another 20 minutes. The uh, moral for today's critical thought is very simple. Play test, play test, and play test. The more you spend examining your gamepad or your control scheme and putting in the hands of people, whether they are experts or newcomers, ultimately it's going to help you out. And if people are having trouble with any particular aspect of your control scheme, Pay attention to that and make adjustments. 
Because like I said, in a per- when things are perfect, no one will be complaining or they may not even mention it. But if you have either a floaty control scheme or th- it's button heavy or it just feels uncomfortable to play, your fan base will let you know. And they will let you know in as many ways as possible. But with that said, we're going to wrap things up here. I said this was going to be a quick critical thought and ran long, so (laughs) sorry about that. But if you're new and you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you have a suggestion for a future one, definitely let me know. But otherwise, thanks for tuning in and check back daily for more great discussions on design here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games. Hopefully our next vlog, I'll say it will be extra long and maybe it will be only five minutes. But until then, have a great night. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, share with your friends. It always helps out. For daily posts on all manner of game design and industry topics, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the site and everything that I do, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. If we can hit goals, it will mean more content for everyone to enjoy, and I'll be able to support myself and my household. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at GWBicer for updates throughout the day and random thoughts from me. And lastly, you can find me on Twitch right over there at GWBicer for daily streams most nights around 10 Eastern. Thanks again for watching the video, and be sure to check out more great content coming to the Game Wisdom channel real soon.